You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options Gold, crude oil, corn, soybeans, and more. With so many tradable products, the futures options market can be an intimidating place. How can you possibly keep track of the latest trading developments across so many different products? Don't worry, we've got you covered. Welcome to This Week in Futures Options, the program designed to help active futures options traders stay on top of this ever-changing marketplace. Each week, we'll break down the top trades, hot products, volatility explosions, and much more. Be sure to check out our live stream via the Mixler app. That's M-I-X-L-R. Or join our live chat room at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. Whether you're an experienced veteran or a newcomer looking to separate the wheat from the lean hogs, this week in Futures Options has the information you can't find anywhere else. This week in Futures Options is brought to you by Quick Strike Options Pricing and Analysis Software. Quick Strike offers powerful and flexible options analysis and pricing tools via an easy to use web based interface. View prices on outright options or spreads with comprehensive page level analysis controls. Build trades, manage risk, or explore historical volatility. Quick Strike has you covered with market data reports ranging from open interest to the term structure of volatility. Quick Strike is the perfect addition to your trading toolkit. Learn more about Quick Strike at Bantix.com. That's B A N T I X. Dot com. And don't forget to follow us on Twitter at QuickStrike1. That's Q-U-I-K-S-T-R-I-K-E-1. This Week in Futures Options is also brought to you by CME Group, the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. CME Group's markets help individuals and businesses around the world manage risks and seize opportunities. CME Group offers the deepest and most liquid options on futures across all asset classes, including interest rates, equity indexes, foreign exchange, energy, agriculture, and metals. For more information and educational resources about about futures options at CME Group, visit cmegroup.com slash options. This Week in Futures Options is also brought to you by FTSE Russell, a leading global provider of benchmarks, analytics, and data solutions. Investors in the U.S. and around the world are using FTSE Russell indexes to benchmark their investment performance and create investment funds, ETFs, structured products, and index-based derivatives. Many Options Insider Radio Network listeners will be familiar with the Russell 2000 Index. Russell 2000 Futures and Options are currently trading on the Chicago Board Options Exchange and CME Group. For more information, please visit FTSERussell.com, CBOE.com, and CMEGroup.com. And now, get ready to break down the latest futures options trading activity. It's time for This Week in Futures Options. All right, everybody. I love that tune. Glad it's not a video show for this one because I'm just here. I'm just here bopping. Throughout that intro, it's that tune. It means it is Thursday. It means it's time for TWIFO this week in Futures Options. A program where the name says it all. We break down the week that was and indeed still is on the on the few tops, as the cool kids like to say, side of the fence. Maybe some ags, maybe some metals, maybe some energy, maybe some fluid milk, maybe some equity. You never know what the heck is going to make it on the show. That's why you got to tune in every week. My name is Mark Longo. Happy to have you with us here on this fun Thursday. Make sure, however you listen, live after the fact, you hit us up. Questions, comments, insights, pearls of wisdom, we do. Yes, indeed, we do like to hear from you guys. And my usual cohorts are both traveling yet again. Sean, I don't know what time zone he's in. I'll have to get an update on him. I know he'll be back soon, though, because the Russell reconstitution is coming back soon, and that always, that always draws him inexorably back 
to the studio here in Chicago where we can enjoy some delicious burger or indeed steak buffets, which is which is always fun whenever he's here in the studio. I always sound full because I am after whenever we're doing shows when he's in studio. And Mr. Nick is off uh, traveling hither and yon as well. But fear not, listeners. I've got an able fellow to join me holding down the CME group hot seat today. It's our old friend, Mr. Uncle Mike Tussaud from St. Charles Wealth Management, a.k.a. the keeper of the sexiest position in the options markets. Mr. Uncle Mike, welcome back to Twifo, sir. Always happy to be here. I think this is one of the, my favorite names of any show. It always makes me think of this week in baseball from when I was a kid. Everyone says that, and people asked us. In fact, uh, when, when Nick and I were first planning the show out, he, we looked into licensing that theme. And um, let's just say it was a little expensive. Uh, perhaps not worth not worth not not getting the bang for the buck uh, here. So uh, we we opted against it. We went for our own custom theme music, which is e- equally fun and enjoyable. I think you'll agree. No doubt about it. Excited to be here. Let's talk some futures options. Let's do it. Uncle Mike, since you're here, since you're joining me, you know where we have to start. You know what we have to talk about. You know, it, it's hot stuff. It, it's it's sexy stuff. Dare I say it is the sexiest position in all of modern markets. Would you agree with me, sir? I, I don't know what can be more exciting. So get if your kids are listening with you, we appreciate that it's a family programming. Get them out of the room for this one because we're going to get hot and bothered here. Uncle Mike, we got to do it. We got to start in your land. Let's talk silver. Let's talk two-year silver collars. Does it get any hotter than that, sir? I say nay. I don't think it is. I mean, the, the cool thing about commodity collars uh, like, like where I'm at right now, and, and a lot of what I do is on the equity side of it, typically. <clears throat> uh, but um, what I like about the skew that exists in the commodity realm, and the same thing exists in the, on the silver futures option side as well. Uh, but what you can do <coughs> is you have the ability to uh, be long something and then have your protective leg be much closer to the current price of the underlying than your... Um, uh, your covered call leg. So in other words, let's say you wanted to go uh, long SLV, which is what I'm doing. It's on the equity side of it. But this concept can also hold true on the uh, futures and futures options side of it. Uh, You have the ability to buy a put option closer to the money, uh, be long the underlying, and then sell a covered call for a very similar price much further out. Uh, In looking at this, uh, the reason I set up this uh, collar of excitement uh, a while back was that you have a downside risk of roughly $2.50, but you have potential upside of almost $10. And so if that doesn't excite you, then I I think you need to check your pulse. I agree, sir. I mean, that's why I can't bring you back too often on the show because it it, it just gets too intense uh, for our audience when we're talking about, I mean, the legion of things you're doing. I mean, just updating, rolling, adjusting. I mean, it's, it's almost the mind boggles, sir, at the lengths you go to. So just give us, if you can, if you can surmise it in a, few, in a little bit of time, uh, give us an update on, on what you've been doing to keep these collars so active and, dare I say it, so darn sexy. For sure, for sure. Well, in terms of what we're doing, here's where the excitement really comes into play for me, and it might actually happen uh, in the near term. Because uh, silver has come down a little bit, uh, as most people who follow markets know, silver has come down a little bit. And so, where the collar can become pretty powerful is when you get to do what I like to refer to as a no-brainer adjustment. So, in other words, let's say that in theory silver, and we still have two years out, let's say that silver in theory went down to zero. Uh, with that being the case, well, fear not, because you have the long put option to protect you, and I don't think silver is going to go to zero anytime soon. But in theory, let's say it did. At that stage, what you have the ability to do is buy to cover the short covered call. And so usually you can do that for a couple pennies or something very insignificant to where on this show, what I've talked about, not only on this show, but also on uh, the other show, the option block that we're on together, is that I like to get out of it a short option when we've been able to capture 80% of the premium that we were trying to capture. So in other words, uh, long story, short, oversimplified example, let's say that you sold a call for a dollar. As soon as that call is able to be bought back for 20 cents, that's my rule of when I like to get out. And so I like to consider that kind of a no-brainer adjustment. So with that, 
let's say that the cost of this collar, I think it actually was maybe like a two penny debit or something like something very insignificant, but let's just say it was even money <clears throat> with it being even money. What needs to be done or what can be done is you have the ability to buy back the short covered call if silver is uh, really taking a tailspin. And so in doing that, essentially what you're doing is then giving yourself free upside. Now, I know typically when people talk about doing options one and two years out, it's like, oh, boy, why are you guys even trading? Oh, what are you doing? And that's oftentimes the way that uh, you're looked at in the option trading world when you're going that far out. So with that, I think this is where the excitement can really happen on this is that, number one, you're in a position to where you're fully taking advantage of the reverse skew that exists within silver. Uh, but number two, if you get a lot of movement to the downside, now we're at a point to where I'm not quite at the 80% mark of getting the premium on the short calls, but I'm getting pretty close. I will have the ability to have unlimited upside on silver, protection to the downside, uh, and the cost of my protection is going to be very insignificant because I'm willing to pay a small debit uh, to have that potential upside. And here's the best part of all of it. I have another 18 months to, for that to happen. There's a lot of things that can happen over that time frame. So what I really like about going far out using, and these types of SKUs exist in other commodities as well. Uh, it's not just silver. But what I like about using the commodity SKU is you can go out a couple years and if you get into a situation to where you get a lot of movement to the downside, you can potentially take advantage of it. And if we do have a big bounce to the upside, then all of a sudden, something that was a very safe trade can pay very lucrative rewards, and you were protected the whole time. So we kind of spoof at this in terms of it being uh, very sexy or uh, very a very boring trade, but... If we get the type of movement in silver that we got back in 2009 through 2011 to the downside or the upside, this could be the most exciting trade ever. But until then, feel free to make fun of me. I'm okay with it. Who, who would ever say such a thing it is boring, Uncle Mike? How, how dare you? How dare you invoke such such terminology? So is the plan is the plan then to keep writing until you're pretty much premium neutral? Then let the kind of dice fly. Are you going to keep keep getting a little bit of income? Or what's the plan once you're kind of at break even with that? Well, what I'd like to do ultimately is that I I, I don't. There, there's an old saying: Let's not get too smart. So in other words, uh, I don't want to do too many things because the original objective of this is to take advantage of this reverse skew and have as much upside as possible on it. But ultimately, let's say that silver goes down a little bit more and I can get out of this short call in the next week or two, let's say. For the time being, I'd likely wait it out. But then if we do get a, catch a bid in silver, um, and let's say silver goes up to the 20 level, I'm just making up a number right now, if that were the case... Uh, then at that point, then maybe I'd roll up the put and then maybe do a tighter collar and then maybe tighten it up a little bit. But until it goes higher, I probably would just ride it out and say, well, OK, I'm losing a little bit to the downside, which I'd already budgeted for in my risk management. I'm losing maybe a little bit more because of the small debit I took for buying back that short call. But for the time being, I just sit on it. But then when it went higher, uh, once it were to go to 20, 30, or whatever, at that stage, I would make a decision. Uh, is this position worth keeping, or is it time to just go to something else, or do we need to recollar this? See, the beauty of this reverse skew that exists on here is that collars can be very favorable. Um, I think we, do, I can get into the reverse skew of what that is on this versus S&P options, if you'd like, but uh, I don't want to bore the audience, but it's up to you, Mark. It is your show. We have talked about that before. That's one of the reasons we like the metals. I've said it many times, gold, but silver is also a candidate for that as well, where it's effectively the skew evolves. It's different. You know, the S&P and most indices, it's going to be, and most equity options, quite frankly, outside of some weird, you know, biotechs and some earnings aberrations are going to have the premium bid to the puts and a discount to the calls from a volatility perspective. And it doesn't really change. The slope may change, but the shape of the curve never really changes and when you're looking at the metals, they're, they're going to swing, and they're going to swing pretty wildly, and that's what makes it kind of fun, and that's what makes it kind of interesting. The other, the other thing people bring up, Uncle Mike, a lot when you're going out so far in two years is that sometimes it can be kind of wide, right? So the liquidity isn't always there like the way it is front month at the money. 
in, in a product like silver. So I'm curious for you, was that a bit of a hurdle? Was there was a liquidity an issue trying to get these things off? Did that come into into play as you were constructing this collar? No, I mean, that's a very valid point. And I think that there's definitely a lot more liquidity in the near term than there is two years out. No doubt about that. Uh, when I was doing it, though, I, I put in limit orders and I, I got the, the fills that I got. And it was were good enough to where it made, made it worth it. <clears throat> I mean, I was I've been around, I've been doing this for, gosh, almost 20 years now as a trader. And so it's funny, I, I guess I've gotten spoiled like a lot of our listeners probably have and that you look at an option to where you get um, a spread on like an S&P future and it's uh, like maybe one tick. So effectively on something that is worth uh, almost 100000 or, or a six-figure underlying, your spread is roughly $12.50. And so with that, you get used to something like that. And one thing that I've found through the years is that, yes, we do have a wider spread, but 10, 12 years ago, this would have been a perfectly fine spread, even on a front month option. So I think we've gotten spoiled through the years with better liquidity, but uh, spoiled is a good thing when it comes to execution. You know, I like having you on because it gives me a chance to talk some silver options, which you don't always get a chance to do. So werewolves go hide in the corner for a little bit. You're not going to like this next part. But let's break down. Let's play a little bit of a fun guessing game. I'm looking right now. By the way, listeners, you guys can, as always, play along with the home game, cmegroup.com slash twifo, T-W-I-F-O. If you go there, you'll see exactly what I am looking at here. If you like dark mode, feel free to turn it on. I like have it on, but, you, you know, to each their own. Uh, looking at silver right now, again, go into the drop down, go into metals, then go into silver. You'll find what we got right here. And then TWIFO, remember, looking at the TWIFO report. Uh, not just, there's a lot of reports in there. The TWIFO report is the one you want. Coming into showtime here, silver right around, right around a 14 half, almost even. Uh, off, right, not quite half a percent, but uh, close to it here this week. So kind of a, a lazy downside week here for silver. Uh, looking all things, uh, the vol, vol actually up a bit, which is kind of interesting. But Uncle Mike, coming into showtime here, we're off about a, roughly half a percent. Silver at 14 half. Let's play a fun guessing game. If you had to guess, what was the option du jour this week in silver? Remember, we go out a little bit, so you can guess month and strike. If you get the strike, you get bonus points. If you get the month, you get bonus points. You get both of them, you get double bonus points. But I'm curious, what is your spidey sense telling you was the, was the hot option this week in silver options, sir? I will go January 1450, January ah. of 2020. Calls? Yes. Oh, so silver upside. Interesting. That, that, the silver bull in you coming out in here. Well, you may be saddened to learn. It's a little bit closer to home, and it's a little bit more to the dark side. It's the July 14 even puts uh, going Ooh. up roughly 2,200 times. Actually, the lion's share, about 1,100, almost half of that going up today. About 1,100 went up today. So someone's playing in uh, the July 14 puts today, uh, which is kind of... And they've been playing all week. A couple of thousand have gone up. Remember, we're talking a couple of thousand here in our listeners, so we're not talking the same size as gold or WTI or certainly not the indices or euro dollars. It's, silver's a little bit more of a nuanced product, shall we say. But still, 2,000 contracts is pretty big for all things silver. And then hot on its heels uh, were the July 1475 calls. Those traded primarily yesterday. Nearly about 1,400 went up this week. 1,052 went up yesterday. So yesterday was a big day for those. Not like someone's legging into a risk reversal in July out there or anything today or a collar along those lines. Outside of that, those are kind of the big prints. I'm looking for any, any aberrations as we are wont to do here in uh, all, things, uh, all things precious. Not seeing a lot. Speaking of all things precious, let's keep that theme rolling. Uncle Mike, I know you like to sling a little bit of gold, too, so let's talk a little bit of gold as well here. Pulling that up again, the same drop-down metals. Let's choose gold in the TWIFO report, listeners, and you're off to the races. Coming into showtime here, gold uh, up a little bit, so gold bugs will have a little bit of a, a smile on their face. Still not quite north of that, that level everyone's watching, right, the 1300 level, but we're a lot closer than we were. Uh, 1293 coming into showtime up right around four handles or about again about a third of a percent similar percentage that silver was to the downside gold is to the upside this week vol also continuing uh to creep up but it's a mixed bag it's more in the front portion of the curve you go a little bit farther out vol kind of unched we've talked about it before <laughs> cold vol bit of a uh, bit of a uh, <laughs> bit of a lost cause but as we said before and nick has pointed out rightfully on the show many times if you scalp aggressively it does pay the rent so 
there is merit in it uh, from that perspective. And let's see, coming into showtime here today, what is the hot, what's going on in Goldland? Oh, by the way, before we even get to that, some interesting research uh, coming out of our buddy, Mr. Norland. Eric Norland's been on the show many times. Of course, uh, one, of the, one of the economists over there at CME does great stuff. If you want to check out his and Blue and the rest of the team's research over there, just go to cmegroup.com. They put it right there on the homepage. You don't even have to click through. It's pretty easy to find, and it's pretty cool stuff. His latest piece just came out yesterday, actually, so hot off the presses, it is gold and the impact from U.S. and Chinese policies. And again, as always with this stuff, a lot of great visuals, a lot of great data and charts. I encourage you to go check it out for yourselves. Uh, but in a nutshell, he talks about how gold's been on a bit of a wild ride over the past decade and change. Between 2000 and 2011, we saw uh, go from $280 up to $1,900, drop back down to $1,050 in 2015. But today, again, we're at that close to that $1,300 level. Uh, and he prices it up in different ways for U.S. denominated and Chinese uh, currency denominated investors. And the returns have been roughly similar, uh, which is you know interesting from that perspective, getting the FX kind of component uh, baked in there. And again, but he talks about the ways those returns could diverge as U.S. and Chinese monetary policies tend to diverge themselves there. If the Chinese continues to grow their debt. If our budget deficit continues, that could be bullish globally for everybody across the, across the way for gold. You know, if Fed rate cuts, again, if they do happen, which we'll see on that, uh, that could also be bullish for gold. Uh, if it doesn't cut rates, uh, that, of course, which is kind of the way the Fed's leaning right now. You can look at the CME uh, Fed Watch tool for yourselves and, and look for that. But the, they're not pricing in a lot, spoiler alert, of a high probability of a, of a, of a cut in the near future. Or, say, or, or, or excuse me, of a, of a rate hike in the near future, a cut. Could, could indeed be a more on the board. Then, of course, that could hurt, uh, could hurt gold. And uh, some interesting charts about the different deficits of us versus China, how that impacts these things. So if you're into the macro scene, you're into gold, into metals, again, I encourage you. That one's hot off the presses. Many, many more pages, many charts. I kind of just gave, a, gave it a little bit of lip service here. I'll have to have Eric back on in blue to kind of catch us up on their recent uh, their recent. Recent gold. Speaking of recency and precious metals and gold, Uncle Mike, I know, I know that the sexy thing is the two-year silver collar. I know that's kind of what brought you to the dance, but I know you like yourselves a little bit of gold, a little bit of GLD out there as well. Anything catching your eye in the other, the other shiny stuff these days, sir? No, I mean one thing about gold is that it's a little bit more of a steady player. So to give you an idea of it, um, what I like to look at in gold is that something that a lot of times. Um, I think it's more of one that uh, it, silver's the poor man's gold is what oftentimes is said. But what's interesting about gold lately is that even though silver has come down over the last couple of months, gold has kind of held steady. Uh, and that, um, yeah, both of them have come down if you want to look at it since February, but gold's been a little bit more of a steady player. So that makes me think that if uh, <coughs> the metals do have a comeback, that silver might be the pick to click just because it might come back at a faster pace. So uh, I think that gold's a little bit more steady at this point, uh, but silver is just like anything. Uh, it, 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 it'll, it's like watching a football team that runs the dive every play. They'll bore you to death running the dive, and then when you least expect it, they'll throw a deep pass. Silver's kind of one of those things to where it'll bore you to death by being in a sideways market for years and years and years. And then all of a sudden, one day we're going to have silver at 40, and uh, everyone's going to say, well, who could have predicted that? Uh, and then the people who were buying silver calls, that's who. Indeed, sir. People who had on two-year silver collars may have predicted just such a thing. Uh, looking at gold here, what's lighting it up? Again, a little bit more action volume-wise in terms of gold uh, versus a silver. This week, OI up about 3%. So about a standard week here for gold options over here, the CME gold options. Uh, about roughly half, 46% of the paper this week coming in the July contract. So July was, again, leading the dance also in gold. Uh, we're at, I said we're threatening that 1,300 level. It wasn't the 1,300 calls, though, that were leading the dance this week. That usually is the, is the go-to de facto choice. You pick an even number in gold, usually 1,300. That's where people are aggregating their liquidity. This week, not so much. It was 1,310s. That was the juicy active contract out there in July. Uh, doing a lot of paper, doing 2,000 contracts today, 2,300 yesterday, and about 500 on Tuesday. Again, truncated holiday week this week 
listeners here. So about roughly 5,000 close to it going up this week. A good chunk of that opening. So opening near-term upside in gold sounds like uh, some relatively normal bullish gold paper out here. Worth noting uh, the numbers in the 1320s, at least today, are pretty similar. Right, right about 2,000 almost exactly. So it looks like maybe a 10-handle vertical going up out here as uh, well uh, that would that wouldn't surprise me given the the similarity of the number much more opening maybe a roll as well maybe rolling from the 1310 to 1320 because the numbers opening wise are much higher of course again we don't have today's oi so but more opening on the 1320s so uh, bear that in mind and then as we like to do also worth noting there was actually yeah 1320s were actually the number two trade of the week there are about 4700 of those going up this week then the 1300s they were a mere number three again all in july with 4200 all of those pretty much open not all opening but a good chunk opening out there on all of those strikes let's look a little bit farther out as we were want to do to see some uncle mike sometimes some weird Funky paper shows up in the in the options chains. You go a little bit farther out, particularly in gold. That's where a lot of this tends to linger. And it looks like this week is uh, is no different, listeners. We've got first off seventeen hundreds lighten it up, twenty six hundred and fifty times. These are in where are these? These are in D next year, D of twenty twenty. Uh, looks like we may have our old friend the the funky risk reversal whale. Uh, call him what you want, risk reversal, but, uh, you know, he was the ratio spread whale going up here. Trading again today, so I don't have OI numbers on these. Uh, but it looks like the big trade was the 1700s, but also they went up 2,650 times. But as it happens to be, the 1400s going up 1,325 times, and the 2,000 calls going up 1,325 times. So one by two by one looks like a nice little juicy fly uh, here going up in gold. Uncle Mike, are, are you, I mean, this is... Um, this is pretty bullish, but then again, this is all the way out to Dece of next year. Is that one? How's that one float your boat? The Dece 1400, 1700, 2000 fly, effectively, you know, doing it one by two by one. I can't say the man's not bullish or the woman's not bullish, whatever the, whoever it may be. <coughs> you know, the thing I like about um, the butterfly, especially if you do a butterfly further out, is the fact that you have potential flexibility. It likely was not a lot of money relative. It's usually not a lot of money relative to the potential movement you get. But you have to be able and willing to do adjustments whenever you're doing a butterfly, especially one that far out, because it's very unlikely that the ending is that the the final price of gold is going to be exactly at. Uh, the body of the butterfly. So whenever anyone does a butterfly, I always like to tell them that uh, you have to be ready, willing, and able to do adjustments on it. Uh, so for example, let's say that uh, uh, gold went down a little bit, uh, perhaps maybe buy back those calls, uh, roll them down, create something different with it. Uh, if gold were to continue to go up, then you have to be prepared to handle that as well. So I think that whenever anyone's doing a butterfly, the benefit of doing them is that they're real typically inexpensive uh so that way you can have a lot of exposure for a small amount of money and then the closer you get to expiration just due to uh time decay gamma and delta become greater and greater in your favor uh but as with anything you have to be prepared to adjust uh, and be nimble when doing a butterfly because it very rarely does the it's not like if you have just like a call spread and if gold were to go to the moon then you're in good shape and uh, you just let it expire in the money if you want to. The butterfly, it's a little bit more tricky than that. You've got to be prepared to adjust. So I like this trade, assuming this person is ready to adjust and they didn't put a lot of money, a lot of their trading capital into it in the first place. If those two factors are in place. I like it. I heard a rumor all the kids' college account is in this one, this one trade, sir. So. So, uh, <laughs> well, it looks like the kid better be prepared to go to junior college. Then. <laughs> there we go. You know, nothing wrong with a trade. You know, that uh, that really that builds character and they can, you can do pretty well in those. Uh, let's see. Speaking of doing well, if that was if people think gold's going to do well, if that wasn't bullish enough for you, Uncle Mike. Another little hidden gem lurking in the farther off months. This one's a little bit closer to home. June of next year, June of 2020. Uh, if you want if I had a set of fancy flies and adjustments and ratios, Uncle Mike, forget all that. Let's just go straight up upside to the tune of 2,000 of the June 2,000 calls. What do you think about those? Just straight up gobbling those bad boys up. I don't have the exact execution on these, but given what I know of, of gold and its paper, I, I feel fairly confident saying this is probably a buy. What do you think about that one versus just straight up fly, sir? Just straight up 2,000. Have at it. 
Well, I think anything where you get 2,000 of the 2,000s, you got to appreciate the creativity that goes in, goes into that. There's a, there's a nice symmetry. Be- there's a nice symmetry to it. It is, and I'm willing to bet that someone's calculation probably came out to where, you know what, we're supposed to buy 1,986 of these, but you know what, let's just do 2,000 of the 2,000s, so that way when they talk about this on the on, uh, TWIFO, it'll have that ring to it. I'm willing to bet that happened. But uh, <clears throat> no, I mean... Typically, buying out-of-the-money calls, I, I do it at times, and I like it, but you got to be able to, uh, as you put it, uh, pay the bills by scalping some gammas now and then. Uh, if the market goes down, you may want to sell a put spread or something to get a, get a little bit of premium uh, sold. Uh, market goes higher, maybe sell a call spread or something along those lines. Uh, if you're buying out-of-the-money premium, unless you're darn sure that that's going to happen, uh, just be very careful with that because uh, time decay happens a lot quicker than most people think. It does indeed, sir. Let's keep on rolling. The show, unfortunately, goes quicker than we think. We're already cruising through a lot of it. Uh, but I know you like yourself a little bit of equities, Uncle Mike. We're going to get to those as well. Uh, this week, you know, as we've kind of talked about before, ball was kind of up and kind of coming back off. Coming into showtime, it was VIX cash was right around a 17 and a half. So that puts it about a point higher. Again, that's all that kind of trade war, will they, won't they dance, kind of injecting a little bit of juice back into the space. But again, some of that coming off today after yesterday's big sell-off today, uh, not so much. We saw RBX in a similar position. It was right around a 20 and a half. RBX, of course, the VIX of the Russell 2000 off about half of a handle. That VIX RBX spread was pretty wide last show. It was around four and a half handles. It's come in quite a bit. It's around three handles now. So a lot closer, a lot tighter than it was. Still not very tight, but tighter than it was a uh, a week ago and you know the story if you've been looking at anything you know equity is going up on cme it seems like all the love all the oxygen is in those micro futures those are just um lighting up the tape i think to put it charitably cme has come out and said that is their their most rapidly adopted most popular new product they've ever launched and so clearly (laughs) there's a there's an audience out there uh, for retail and a lot of institutions as well who want maybe a little bit more nuanced contract they like the micros uh, you can keep asking us about the options. We don't know about the options yet. I would like to see some options on it. In the meantime, though, uh, the uh, the standard E-minis, they used to be the mini. They used to be the small. Now, now it seems so big. Uh, but the standard E-minis uh, are also doing a lot of paper out here. Let's look really quickly. Let's start in Russell 2000 land. Russell 2000, right around a 14, close to 1480, about 1478.5. Uh, off of nearly 40 handles, nearly 2.5%. So another... Another bloody week here for the small caps. You know, this talk about small caps being completely insulated from trade wars. <laughs> the sell-offs we've seen lately, uh, you know, maybe maybe challenging that a little bit. Vol, of course, net up on the week, given the fact that we're still off uh, so much out here. Uh, and looking at where the action was for the week, it was actually, actually was some big prints out here. And it was, again, 1,300 puts. Going up, these are uh, these are SEP. These are the SEP puts going up. Uh, actually, quite a few times. Looks like that's a pretty big print for the Russell 2000 options. 1,652. All of them going up on Wednesday. Action looks like actually a good chunk of that was closing. So someone maybe uh, maybe deciding a little bit of long term discretion was the better part of valor closing out. But the more than the closing traded today. So it looks like uh, traded that day. I should say on Wednesday. So it looks like a little bit of back and forth action. Uh, Wednesday was was clearly the active day out here, and again, that's not surprising, given the fact that we saw a lot of blood on the screens uh, on that day. Mister Uncle Mike, uh, do you do you watch the small caps at all? Is Russell two thousand is that in your basket of indicators? And then I know you like S and P, so if not, or even if so, what is catching your eye out there in S and P land as well? You down with S and P? Yeah, you know me. I'm dating myself a little bit with that quote. Um, no, I t- typically don't watch the small caps that much anymore. I mean, I've traded the Russell many times throughout the years, but uh, it's been a few years since I've really traded it. I'm more focused on the S and P. Uh, I think right now uh, we were talking about this a little bit on the show on the option block. I, I think 2,800 is a pretty key number at this stage for the S and P. I think that uh, we're at a stage to where uh, it's kind of like a magnet style number, uh, meaning uh, that. I don't think we're going to go much higher than that 
at this stage, but I don't think we're going to go much lower than that. Uh, we could stay pretty close to it, but if you just look at a chart of uh, either the SPX, the, S the, the, the mini, the big contract, whatever you want to look at, 2,800 has been a fairly key number now for, I'm just looking back, we originally hit resistance on it about of June of last year, and then we broke through it. But we have crossed the 2,800 mark, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 times. And that, I mean, like there's an more, even more so than that, but we've crossed it on a major chart pattern probably 12 times. And so the fact that we can't get away from this 2,800 mark, I think that's going to be a key number uh, going forward. I remember 2,000 was also like this. Uh, when the S&P was crossing 2,000 for the last time a few years ago. Uh, but right now, I think 2,800 is now very much a, I like to refer to it as a magnet-style number. Definitely. Definitely seems to be the case. You know, uh, speaking of magnets out here, uh, when we're talking uh, all things all things WTI, the magnet for a long time was 60. Will it? Won't it? Can it? Will it? What will happen around that 60 hand? And once we broke through it to the upside, everyone's like, oh, wow, here we are off to the races. Now that we've broken through it again to the downside and now are maintaining below that level out there in WTI, that's another uh, little bit of a, a magnet type, uh, type action out here. And in terms of coming into showtime here, crude off yet again. Again, the, the trade war kind of dwarfing the other drivers for demand and supply out there in crude land. You know, we saw last week that kind of surprise increase uh, in the stockpiles this week, there was a little bit of a draw in U.S. stockpiles, but not much. Remember last week, it was a gap of nearly five million barrels, uh, which uh, really kind of uh, I think shocked the market a bit and sent us sent us spiraling down south of that sixty handle this week. Couldn't really break it. In fact, uh, couldn't challenge it to the upside. In fact, uh, down another two handles, about three and a half percent again to about sixty six and a half. Coming into showtime, crude ball up. So again, we've talked a lot. I think we're going to have Russell on here next week. Uh, he's done a lot of research into into energy volatility and the options. And we talked. If you listen to our show, we did at OIC. We touched on it a bit then, and how everyone talks about equities and some of the other things for volatility. But uh, the energy vol is kind of understated, and when it moves, it can move. And so I think that'll be a, a fascinating conversation. We'll dig into that more. Uh, a little bit next week, but the vol up pretty strong. Again, multiple handles, two, three, four handles, six handles, depending on where you're looking here on the curve. Even longer out, farther out, out here to the middle of next year, seeing vol up eight handles. So uh, that kind of speaks to how when, when, when the vol wants to correct to the upside, <laughs> equity vol can do it, but energy vol is no slouch uh, when it comes to that department. In terms of where the action was this week, again, it was July 56% of the paper going up here in July. We said we're at the 56 half level coming into showtime. It was the double puts, 56, 55 puts, excuse me, that were lighting up the tape. 17,000 contracts, trading pretty much 6,000 a day or close to it uh, all throughout the week. A little bit of that closing, actually. So looks like a lot of back and forth paper with a bias, a couple of thousand contracts net closing on the week. So again, it's kind of a close to add the money strike, a lot of back and forth churn. Not exactly surprising. A little bit longer term here. Anything crazy. 75 calls going up 1,600 times. Dece to 2020. That's kind of one of the uh, weirder prints we got here on the long-term books out here. Uh, let's go really quickly because we got to get to it here, listeners. Uh, we'll get to a little bit of your futures options feedback. It's time for your questions, comments, and insights. It's time for Futures Options Feedback. Submit your questions at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, stocktwits.com slash options insider, or via questions at the options You can also submit your feedback via our Options Insider Radio Network mobile app. Available for iOS, Android, and Kindle Fire devices. You can even ask your questions live every Friday at 3 p.m. Central via our Mixler chat room. So grab the Mixler app or just search for Options Insider at Mixler.com. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com. All right, everybody, welcome to your feedback. A lot of people writing in about uh, corn. CME themselves, themselves are talking about corn and corn vol this week. Uh, we talked corn a lot on the show last week, as you might remember, listeners. Uh, CME tweeting out uh, May implied vol in the July corn contract 
Uh, so during the month of May, I should say, the July contract, a little bit confusing there, uh, went from low of 22% to a high of 40%. Remember, we talked about the big move in Corn Vol last week. Uh, but Nick couldn't be on the show, but he tweeted this out saying the Corn Vol is kind of in quotes up. But if you dig in over there on the quick strike, you realize that most of that increase, and in particular in the front month, that's where a lot of the action is out there. And we always talk about you know front month gamma versus vol, what the difference is. But a lot of that has all been pretty much the slide up the established vol curve. So remember, we talked before about slipping and sliding, uh, and they, they have actually have that broken down in the, in the TWIFO tools. So you guys can see that for yourselves. Uh, but this is more of a moving along the skew curves. So this is not really unexpected. This is kind of what's, what the skew is pricing in. That's where the vol should be given these, uh, this move we've seen out here in corn. So what, what, he, what he noted on and is kind of worthy of no for all of you writing and asking about this is that we didn't see any extra bid. We didn't see the vol really jump off the curve, the curve really shift anything along those lines. It was kind of just sliding along the curve, and it pretty much stayed there, which if we saw some aberrant move, some aberrant interest out there, you would have seen that vol pop even more and move off the curve, and we didn't really see that again. You guys can follow all that for yourself, cmegroup.com uh, slash twifo, or bantix.com is a place you can sign up for that. Uh, people chiming in this week. Options game, longtime listener, says, you guys don't need to talk about gold anymore. There is no vol. <laughs> well, you're kind of right. I don't know, Uncle Mike, should we just table all gold discussion, uh, no vol out there? What do you think? No, I think that uh, there's still stuff to talk about, but if there's no vol in there, then uh, we can talk about buying options and taking advantage of it that way. There's no vol, buy some options. Yeah, you know, that's what we said. In fact, uh, Nick has been out here beating that drum many times that it quote-unquote pays the rent. I've, I've teased him he needs to create a report. In the Twifo that shows the options that are paying the rent this week. Uh, but if you scalp a, a little bit aggressively out there in gold and you get moves, that's the funny thing. The vol is low, but you do get moves to pay for it. So uh, it certainly don't be, don't, don't be harvesting the risk premium out there. Not really worth it out there. But we will talk about it every now and then if you don't mind, Mr. Options Game. Because, or maybe Mrs. I don't know. Uh, because uh, it, it, does, it does pay the rent. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Russell 2000. Here's an interesting one. Right up your alley, Uncle Mike. Since we're talking metals today. Lil, Lil Cast wants to know, are GLD and SLV really the best choices for traders looking for ETF exposure to commodities? I like the fact that they hold the physical. They hold the physical commodity. Yeah, you know, you can't, it's hard to really go wrong with those two. I and mean, we talk about so many other ETFs out there that suffer from, you know, the negative roll yield and everything else. I don't care what it is. It could be a USO, it could be a VXX. All these ones that are trying to use futures or effectively trying to create these baskets of futures to replicate a different position, they have all sorts of issues. When you just got to stick to the physical, I know there are, some people have some issues with the tracking and how much gold is actually tracked in the GLD and SLV. And you might have issues with that. That's fine. Uh, but in general, they, they don't have the legion of other issues that plague a lot of uh, ETFs. Uncle Mike, would you, would you go along with this listener, Lil Cast, that they think, um, would you agree with that? GLD and SLV, kind of the, some of the better starting points for people looking for some ETFs that can track commodities? I think it's definitely the 800-pound gorilla in the room. I mean, if you want liquidity, if you want to be with the biggest one, uh, those are the ones with which you can go with. Uh, just there, there will be, and there are, I think there actually is another one that actually does hold physical silver now, but uh, to give you an idea of how big or how small it is, if there's anyone that should know of what it is, it's me, and I don't. Uh, so I think that just shows the lead uh, that both SLV and GLD have on everybody else. I mean, if if you're not holding, if you have the ability to hold physical I think that does really help you out a lot. Uh, even if you had to pay a few extra basis points for that privilege, I think that's something that's very important because I don't want to be holding something that, as uh, Andrew Giovinazzi says on our other show, is predictably crappy. Yes, uh, very predictably crappy for a lot of these other ETFs. And uh, that's why uh, we're not, quite frankly, in love with them. You know, if you want to get, that's why we do this show. If you want to get the actual exposure to the actual underlying, guess what? Go figure. The actual underlying is the best place to go. And options on those underlyings are the best places to go. So uh, that's why we do this whole show uh, here to talk about that. But yeah, if you got to, if you got to go the ETF route for maybe tax reasons or your securities account reasons and you want to have some quality exposure, ETF GLD, pretty, pretty good options, pun intended. Unfortunately, listeners, that music means we've come uh, to the end of our show today. Got to cut it a little bit early. I got to I got to dash out of the studio immediately after this. Uh, so we got to got to kind of bring it to a close here. But uh, Uncle Mike, I appreciate your a 
for joining me to talk about the sexiest of the options positions, a.k.a. the two-year silver collars. Before we go, people want to call you up. They want to pick your brain about long-term medals or pretty much anything else. Maybe rolling some S&P puts, all the other fun stuff you do. Where should they go? What should they do, sir? Well, by all means, go to my website, stcharleswealth.com. Would love to talk with you about uh, anything options. Exciting time to be alive. (laughs) It is. That's why I like having you on, the, the rampant optimism. That infects all of your content, sir. Check out Uncle Mike. Give him a call. Give him some love for all the love that he gives us here on the network. Silver collars, all the other fun stuff that he does. StCharlesWealth.com is the place to go. Guess what? You don't have to live in St. Charles. He'll still work with you. I I have it on good authority. He works with clients outside of St. Charles as well. So give him a call. Hit him up. StCharlesWealth.com is the place to go. While you're hitting things up, SeeMeGroup.com slash Twifo or indeed BanTix.com, B-A-N-T-I-X.com. Or even quickstrike.net, all three of those places you can go to kick the tires and light the fires on Quick Strike. It's what we use to drive this show. We literally could not do it without it. Well, we could, but it's a lot more fun doing it this way. So if you're trading these products, if you're interested in them, if you want to just learn more, you really got to check it out for yourselves. The free version, seemingroup.com slash twifo. Upgrade over there at Bantix and quickstrike.net when you're ready to go to the paid, the paid, the premium version to get a lot of the other goodies that we use here on the show. But trust me, if you're looking at these products, if you're analyzing them, if you're trading them, if you just want indicators, there literally is no other choice. You, you kind of got to go here. So check them out over there. Tell Nick, tell Nick you listen to the show. He'll love to hear from you. And, of course, while you're checking out data and all things fun, Sean will be back in the studio soon to talk about Russell and everything else. In the meantime, they put out a lot of great data over there. You can give them a follow at FTSE Russell on Twitter. Give them FTSERussell.com. All that data about the reconstitution, how it's going to change the Russell, how it's going to drive a lot of volatility. Last year, spoiler alert, drove a lot of paper. I expect it to happen again this year. So it should be something fascinating to watch. FTSERussell.com is the place to go. And, of course, Seamy Group. You know how to find them. SeeMeGroup.com. Check out those great reports from Blue and Eric. A lot of great stuff there. If you want some good reading, some good data, some good analysis on a variety of – they had a good one. I want to bring him back on just for – he did one on equity skews recently. They haven't had a chance to talk to them about either. So there's a lot of great data. They're almost they're doing too much. I can't keep up with it all on the show here. So a lot of great data. SeeMeGroup.com is the place to find it. On behalf of myself – and my good buddy here, Uncle Mike, and even Sean and Nick and everybody at CME. And I want to thank all of you for downloading, streaming, subscribing, sending in questions, for commenting, for listening live, all the fun stuff that you do. Keep it coming. We'll see you back here tomorrow for Volatility Views, and then we'll see you back next week for more of This Week in Futures Options. The preceding program was a production of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider or via questions at the options insider.com. 